from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Uber rises after third quarter sales jumped 72%. I'll ask CEO Dara Khosra Shahi why he's saying the business is now, quote, stronger than ever. Plus, Elon Musk is now the Twitter complaint hotline operator, that according to his Twitter bio, and giving us an idea of what the subscription model for the platform will look like. And he founded one of Uber's biggest competitors and wrote the book on it. Grubhub founder Mike Evans joins us to talk about his journey from then to now. All of that in a moment, but first stocks bouncing back from session lows, but not much more. I want to bring in our Ed Ludlow for a look at the markets and a few more big tech company earnings reports. Ed. Yeah, let's get right to earnings and Airbnb. The stock down around 6% in after hours as we're speaking. Um, and it was all about a disappointing outlook for the final three months of this year. Revenue of $1.8 to $1.88 billion, below street expectations. But the language from Airbnb that the pace of nights and experiences booked will, quote, moderate slightly into the fourth quarter. That clearly a concern. AMD, interesting, missed projections for the fourth quarter seeing 5.5 billion dollars of sale plus or minus 300 million below street expectations but have the broader context this is a time when amd's competitors are seeing contractions and this would still represent growth also seeing top line growth of 45 percent for its server business year on year in the third quarter which offset weakness in pc markets you're right in the main session throughout tuesday there were jitters in the market right it was another case of Good economic data, bad news for the market, strength in the labor market, reinforcing this idea that the Fed will stay aggressive. You see weakness in the NASDAQ 100 down 1%, broadly tech underperforming, but strength in semiconductors with the stocks up 8 tenths of 1%, with the yields not really moving as much as we've seen in previous sessions, and Bitcoin kind of trading sideways around 20,000 US dollars per token. One of the bright spots in the technology sector Tuesday was Uber M, having its best day since the first week of August. I'm really interested in this story because because it's now trading its highest level in around six weeks. A beat on the top line with third quarter sales jumping 72% year on year, coming in at 8.3%. 3, 4 billion above street expectations. Uh, real strength here. There was some fighting talk from Uber and in particular its CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi, who says, frankly, the company's not worried about consumer demand dropping off right now. All right, Ed Ludlow. Well, we're going to talk to him about that right now. Ed, thank you. For more on Uber's results, let's bring in the man himself, Uber CEO, Dara Khosrowshahi. Dara, great to have you with us as always. So let's start with the good stuff. Active riders back to pre-pandemic levels. Tell us the trends that are driving this and how well you see it keeping up in a downturn. Well, the big meta trend that we're seeing now is that the U.S. consumer, consumer in general, and especially the U.S. consumer, is still spending. But you're seeing a shift of that spend from spend on retail goods uh, during the pandemic, people were at home, et cetera, back to services. Travel sector is incredibly strong. Restaurant, hospitality sector is strong. People are going back to work. And all of that is benefiting the Uber business. Uh, our mobility business is incredibly strong. Delivery is proving to be a really sticky habit. All of that translates into gross bookings of $29 billion, up 32% on a year-on-year -year basis. And then, of course, adjusted EBITDA um, coming in super, super strong uh, in terms of you know over $500 million adjusted EBITDA in the quarter. And then what we indicated for next quarter is adjusted EBITDA range of $600 to $630 million. So even more strength ahead for us. Still, riders aren't taking as many rides as they used to. What else needs to happen before Uber sees a full recovery? Or do you ever get back to those numbers? I think we will absolutely get back to those numbers and hopefully beyond. And you're seeing signs of that, which is trips per monthly active. Pre-pandemic, we're about 5.7 uh, trips uh, per monthly active. Uh, they were stuck at about five trips per monthly active. And you've seen that come up to 5.3 now, and it's absolutely headed in the right direction as the world opens up, as, you know, again, people go out to restaurants, et cetera. 
What we also have is a power of the platform. In that pre-pandemic, we were essentially a rides-only business. Now, our rides and our eats business are of equal size. And essentially, we are moving our riders, upselling them Uber Eats, and we're upselling our eaters to grocery and then back to rides as well with the Uber One membership program, which now has launched in eight markets. So we're confident that we can drive higher frequency, higher engagement with our platform just because of the breadth of use cases that we have now. Let's talk about delivery, demand holding up. As you said, it's a very sticky habit, profit looking really good, but we're not seeing notable growth. Is this an area where you're seeing the impact of inflation set in where some customers might be saying, you know, maybe I'm going to order out one less time this week or this month just to be more conservative? Well, we're definitely seeing the impact of comps, remember? So last year we weren't fully opened up or recovered. So when you look at our delivery growth, X foreign exchange, because foreign exchange has hurt us, it's hurt Google, it's hurt basically any global company out there. Our growth on the delivery side actually accelerated from 12% to 13% this last quarter. We think that Q4 will be similar or slightly higher in terms of year over year X FX growth. And what we're seeing there is that our audience of delivery continues to grow. Basket sizes are higher. Some of that is inflationary as well. As well. And when we look at the frequency of ordering of users, that's stable. So users are continuing to use our delivery uh, uh, product as they have before. And really, we're comping against pandemic comps. And we're also uh, uh, being hurt by foreign exchange. But the underlying growth of the business is healthy. And we think it's going to keep healthy for some period of time. Now, I've been traveling a lot lately, and yes, my rides per month are going up, but prices are still <laughs> elevated. When are prices going to fully come back down? Will they ever really come back down to where they were? Well, I do think that inflation has affected um, everybody and I think has re-baselined to some extent prices. Uh, so I don't think that prices are going to go down to pre-pandemic levels, uh, but we have seen pricing eased. For example, Q3 pricing versus Q2 pricing surge levels came down. Our average ETAs in terms of, you know, when you push a button, when is when do you uh, get your car? That's improved as well. Service quality levels have improved. So we're hoping that pricing continues to ease going to Q4 on, on next year. But I do think that this is a new baseline. And, you know, our consumers, our riders, our eaters, they're willing to pay, as you can see from the growth rates that we've seen, as it relates to both audience up 14%, uh, trips up 19%, and then obviously gross bookings, which are dollars uh, in the bank, so to speak, up 32%. Driver supply is materially improving. What's, what's happening with incentives? Are we going to see you pull back on incentives? Will they go away completely? Will you keep some around? Well, I think we are going to keep incentives around. But driver supply is improving because we've made real investments in the driver experience. We have uh, radically improved our onboarding process so it's faster. So a higher percentage of drivers who've shown interest in driving for Uber actually make that first trip. We're making that onboard flow faster, easier, customer service available to help you in case you're having any issues with documents, uh, et cetera. Um, driver earnings levels are quite robust. Uh, drivers in the U.S., for example, on average, make $36 uh, per hour engaged on the platform. Those are very robust earnings level, especially uh, with an activity that's completely flexible. You can drive when you want, where you want uh, as well. And then we're also innovating for drivers. Drivers uh, previously, they couldn't, for example, see the upfront price or the destination that they were headed at, that was one of the most requested features. And we shipped that feature for our drivers uh, this last quarter so that they can see the upfront destination, they can see the upfront price, and they can pick and choose what's the trip that's right for them. Uh, and if a trip is not right for them, they can move on to the next trip as well. All of that is adding to more drivers coming onto the platform. But not only are they coming onto the platform, Churn rates are down almost 20% on a year-on-year -year basis, and they're more engaged with us. Uh, the uh, supply hours per driver are up 16% on a year-on-year -year basis. If churn is down and engagement is up, it tells you that we're doing something right. 
It is earnings levels that are really good, but we're very, very much focused on improving the driver experience on Uber and to be the platform for earners to come and earn flexibly and safely. Okay. I want to ask your thoughts on Prop 30. Lyft a big backer of it. Gavin Newsom, the governor, wants it to fail. The revenue from this generated uh, taxing wealthy people would go to EV charging infrastructure, subsidies to buy electric cars, which it seems that Uber has a vested interest in. Why haven't you taken a strong stance on Prop 30 yet? I saw you ran into Governor uh, Newsom on Twitter. Have you talked to him about this? Yeah, I have talked to him about this. And, and it's our feeling that California is making very substan substantial investments in terms of incentivizing EV ownership, in terms of charging infrastructure, and it's definitely showing up in our business. As you know, we've made very significant investments in moving more of our fleet over to EVs. Uh, we have a great uh, partnership with Hertz, for example, to get more Teslas onto the Uber fleet. And California is leading the pack in terms of miles or the percentage of our miles that are EV miles. It's now 9% of miles driven on the Uber network in California are now EVs, which is a pretty extraordinary number. It's really second only to London, that's at 15%. So we feel like we're making the right investments. We are, for example, lowering our own booking fee and making sure that drivers can make more on a trip basis uh, when they move over to EVs. Uh, and in partnership with both public and private, we think California is headed in the right direction which is why you know we've stayed out of Prop 30 one way or the other. The economy, on the other hand, may be headed in the wrong direction. Bloomberg data showing that a recession is very likely. How concerned are you? How are you thinking about costs and spending? I mean, you do have, I, I believe, double the free cash flow that Meta reported this quarter. Will you be opportunistic and look for uh, potential M&A opportunities out there, despite everything that's going on more broadly? Yeah, I think this is one of the most uncertain environments I've been a part of. You know, we it's very difficult to tell where things are going to wind up. I think Europe is certainly going to be uh, weaker and is likely headed into a recession. We're preparing for that. In the U.S., it's unclear. A recession might happen. It might be a soft landing, et cetera. So I think from our standpoint, we want to be prepared for any eventuality. Uh, when you look at our marketplace, we are a marketplace business, so we don't have significant fixed costs. Uh, in a weaker labor environment, our supply position will tend to get better. Uh, we will be a place where more drivers can come to uh, earn real money on. This last quarter, for example, uh, earners earn more than $10 billion on our platform, up over 25%. So we do think that our marketplace gets more attractive to drivers. As it gets more attractive to drivers, prices come down, and that in turn attracts riders as well. Uh, so we think the business model is a good model that can you know, do well in, uh, in strong economies and can perform in weaker economies. And I think as a company and as a technology company, we have been relatively forward thinking in making sure that we prepare ourselves for an uncertain world, making sure we're conservative in terms of the investments that we're making and an investment isn't paying off, pull back, put your money where the growth is. And I think it's showing in the results in terms of top line and free cash flow generation. And when our outlook, even in an uncertain environment, is a super strong outlook and we want to keep it that way. All right. Dara Khosra Shahi, CEO of Uber. As always, Dara, great to have you with us. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you very much. All right, coming up, also a strong earnings report from Arista Networks. We're going to talk with CEO Jayshree Ulal, who's now on the list of the richest self-made women. We'll ask about the state of supply issues and cloud adoption in a looming recession. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to Arista Networks now, which just reported third quarter results beating expectations and even prompted Bank of America to upgrade the stock. Shares were up 
7% or thereabouts at the close. Let's bring in President and CEO Jayshree Ulal now for more. Jayshree, so great to have you back with us. I believe it's been a year since we last talked, and your sales growing 57%. You're on path to grow 45% uh, for the year, which is even bigger than you projected at the start of this year. What are the leading drivers of this, given continuing supply issues, inventory issues, macro concerns? How are you bucking the trend? <laughs> Good to be back, Emily. We got to keep this anniversary trend going. Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, first of all, it's great to have our own little micro momentum in a larger set of issues that you just described from a macro. And I would attribute it to great products and technology, a great set of customers headlined by Microsoft and Meta, or as I affectionately call them, m and m since I like candy. And I think the confluence <laughs> of all these diverse use cases that we're now part of Arista has been, been well known as a data center company. And today we're becoming more of a centers of data company where we're bringing that data to every location. Speaking of M&Ms, which is fitting uh, around Halloween, Microsoft and Meta are leading customers. And I'm curious, why do they rely on Arista so much when more broadly they seem to go with white box retailers for a lot of this back end stuff? No, I think it's a very good question, but I think it's a bit of a misnomer that they only want white box or low cost. The trick is to embrace their requirements and co-develop a partnership that has been on more than a decade in both cases. We actually do co-engineering with them. We partner with them on the supply chain. We partner in procurement. We work with them on different designs and use cases. And in some use cases, obviously, they look for diversity and they build on their own or use other vendors. But the key in both cases that we are in many diverse use cases from the data center to the WAN to the regional spine to the interconnect to a, a new use case that's coming up more and more for AI and ML workloads. And the partnership is indeed not a classical vendor customer one, but we truly take that partnership very strategically and not lightly. Now, the tight supply environment has really dented the growth for most tech bellwethers, uh, unlike Arista. Give us an update on supply issues and inventory issues and when you think those normalize. Well, I tell you, these are the times I wish I were just a software company and didn't have to worry about hardware. But as you know, Arista is really a platform company. Uh, we build a lot of hardware. We have hundreds of uh, manufacturers and vendors we work with, and we have thousands of components on our hardware. So a couple of years ago, uh, Arista really put a plan together, which we had approved by our board, to spend to the tune of four to five billion dollars in man in in uh, getting components and inventory, which is you know an order of magnitude greater than our revenue. Uh, this is kind of unheard of, and we really took a multi-year uh, view on this. And as we got the approval, we started planning well ahead of our demand in 2021 and 2022. And the good news is that has paid off some, but the bad news is we're not getting enough of it. We would still like more components. And despite our best planning efforts, our lead times are prolonged and we're still waiting for what we often call the golden screw. The last 10 or 20 components are still not available and it's hard to build a system without all the components. It would be a little bit like a car without the tires. And so we're looking forward to overcoming that. But um, as we have crossed our first billion dollar quarter in Q2 and marching ahead, we do need more and more of these components to get stronger this year and next year. Meta is raising its CapEx for 2023 and Arista along with NVIDIA and a few others were called out as beneficiaries. Tell us a little bit more about the changing nature of your partnership and how that we should expect that to evolve. And I think that's a really good question, Emily. I think we all know Meta for the strength they have brought as a social networking company and ads, et cetera. But every company has to redefine and reinvent itself and Mark is doing just that. And he's looking forward um, at where to invest and where to put his money where his mouth is, if you will. And one of the important areas for companies like NVIDIA and Arista is that this area of AI and ML applications that will tremendously test the network itself. When you put in hundreds, if not thousands of GPUs and DPUs and storage, et cetera, the pressure you put on the network in bandwidth, latency, dynamically load balancing your flows is huge. It's an order of magnitude more than anything 
that even we have developed and shipped so far to Meta. So the Arista 7800 spine, as an example, will give them that kind of delivery of hundreds of 400 gig ports at very predictable latency, at a buffer and architectural level where they don't drop packets anymore, where they can handle the applications that come in. Now, this is long-term planning. We are only in the first innings of that, but I think a lot of the meta investment will go into AI and ML, which will have a direct impact on the Arista network infrastructure as well, and how we uh, design for them, develop for them, and they procure from us. You've got your analyst day coming up. Talk to us about how we should be looking at growth in the next year. Will these you know, really dreadful macroeconomic um, concerns be a headwind for Arista? How will it all impact cloud adoption if we're heading into a recession? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. We've just had one of our best quarters ever, as you pointed out, and but the rest of the world around us is, is not as beautiful. Um, so as we look at it, we're going to be thoughtful and vigilant of, is there a macro recession? And what is Arista's part in it? Because to some degree, we're having micro momentum. Uh, we think some of the key trends has not affected the data center and the networking infrastructure. It remains strategic and relevant, but should a recession come, Obviously, we won't be immune to it. But at the moment, we're feeling really good. And we have good visibility for the next 6 to 12 months. And we're looking forward to a great analyst day to give our 2023 projections. All right, well, good luck at, at, good luck at analyst day later this week. Uh, Jay Shree Ulal, uh, CEO of Ariston Networks. Great to have you back. Thank you. We're going to be right back with more of Bloomberg Technology after this quick break. This is Bloomberg. TikTok should be banned. That's according to FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr, as reported earlier by Axios, a comment that set shares of Meta rising as much as 4.1% to session highs, Snap spiking as well. Axios saying it's the strongest language Carr has used so far to urge action on TikTok. And while the FCC has no authority to regulate TikTok directly, Congress previously acted after Carr voiced concerns about Chinese tech companies, telecom companies like Huawei. Bloomberg has learned that Tesla is sending workers from China to help with an expansion at its factory in Fremont, California, a move that could help the U.S. facility ramp up production. About 200 people from Tesla's Shanghai plant will head to the Fremont facility on assignments that'll last at least three months. And coming up, Elon Musk wants to quadruple the cost of Twitter Blue subscriptions, cut jobs, and possibly bring back Vine. All things Twitter, next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Twitter owner Elon Musk is teasing a new subscription model for users, $8 per month. He's also making major changes, including limiting content enforcement work just before midterms next week by freezing employee access to internal tools used for content moderation, all while advertisers are being urged by dozens of advocacy groups to boycott the platform if its new billionaire owner lowers safety standards for content. Let's get into it, into it all with Bloomberg's Alex Barinka and Ed Ludlow. So, Ed, give us the very latest here. Let's start with job cuts. We've been waiting for more. Have they happened? Uh, I mean, at all levels of the company, yes. We're hearing that a number of director and senior manager level people have departed, including Jay Sullivan, who is the GM for product for the revenue product and the consumer product. Nick Caldwell, who's head of engineering, has departed. Bloomberg's reported. Uh, the VP of global sales has, report, has departed during the day um, on uh, Tuesday. So this is all happening. You know, a source told me over the weekend that across the product and engineering groups, they were asked to put together a list for layoff candidates that would reduce headcount by 50%. We have not seen a broad wave of layoffs, but what I'm told by sources is that when determining who should be laid off, they've been assessing an individual based on the code contributions, the contributions that individuals made to the underlying source code for the Twitter platform during the, the, the duration of their time at the company. We know there's an all hands meeting called for Wednesday morning and, and that's pretty much it. I know a lot of insiders at Twitter, a lot of staff are bracing for that. 
So let's talk about content moderation, Alex. What's happening? What can, what's being moderated? What's not being moderated? Uh, well, it seems like uh, Elon Musk is self-moderating if you're following um, the, the Nancy Pelosi tweets of this weekend. But it seems like there has been, uh, according to Bloomberg sources, a slowdown in what's being moderated because uh, they basically told that team to pause what they're working on. You'll remember that Elon Musk said that they will create a content moderation system with a group of diverse perspectives, which for me as somebody who follows social media closely reminds me a lot of what they already have. So I think this will be one of the areas that Elon Musk will absolutely have to uh, lay out what the plans will be because it's not just users and the, the posters of content who will really care about this. It is importantly the advertisers where Twitter may Makes most of their money. Those advertisers will want to be, you know, paying to have their brand show up alongside content that they view as unsavory. So that moderation piece is a piece that is widely talked about in the few days since Elon Musk has been the de facto owner of this company. Uh, but we are yet to see kind of exactly the roadmap that he plans to take uh, for Twitter going forward. Then, of course, there have been these developments about Twitter Blue and the subscription service, $8 a month. Ed, what's the latest there? Yeah, I think Elon Musk's arguing on Twitter, because remember, he set this all out in tweets, that A, those compelled to pay for the privilege of blue checkmark verification uh, will want to do so uh, to kind of separate themselves out from the rest of the crowd. He talked about blue carrying with it priority in terms of where responses uh, appear, having fewer ads appear in the timeline. You know, Twitter's verified user base right now is about 450,000 if you go to the app verified account. So if you times that $8 by 450,000 and you times that by 12, it's not really this meaningful shift in business model. It's not going to sort of displace the necessity to have a revenue stream from advertising. But I think the idea is to kind of elevate premium content to have it stand out from what we know Musk believes is a pervasive issue, which is bots on the platform. What about this teasing of Vine coming back to the platform, which of course was this short form video product that Twitter bought uh, and then quickly dissolved, Alex? Is, is, is this really potentially happening? I mean, it's been tweeted about, and that seems to be um, where the latest is happening uh, from Elon Musk. So I will point out that sources told Bloomberg that Vine, you're right, the short form video app that Twitter bought, um, it, it can be revived, but there are some hurdles to doing that. It runs on the old source code. There's been a lot of updates behind the scene. So um, I think folks are in place kind of looking at the viability of that option right now. I will tell you, if you spend time on TikTok like I do, people talk about Vine Energy. There's still a big nostalgia with that. It was the very first kind of real short form video app that got that uh, type of content really popularized and woven into the cultural fabric of conversations online. So uh, it seems like, um, and Elon has kind of uh, joked about this, that he is kind of taking recommendations or questions about what could be coming back. But our sources are telling us that that is one of the possibilities on the table. There's definitely some excitement out there about the possibility of Vine becoming Twitter's version of TikTok. Ed, are these changes going to impact the midterms at all? I mean, we're a, literally a week away when a lot of moderating is normally happening. How could this play out over the next seven days? Yeah, so I, th I think it's really important to be clear on what we've reported, that the group of people who have access to the dashboard and the tools that allow for policy actions to be taken against accounts that have breached policy is gone from like a group of 150 to 15 people. Inside of Twitter, there's a lot of concern that effectively um, Twitter will be short staffed in its ability to deal with content moderation over the course uh, of the midterms next Tuesday and Wednesday. That said, um, you know, we reported that over the weekend, according to sources, there was some content moderation in a limited way going on um, with the Brazilian election, despite the suspension of those tools and the freezing of access for some employees. If you also go on your Twitter timeline, you'll start to see um, basically alerts from Twitter about the upcoming midterm elections and explaining some of the work they've already done. And, and we'd imagine that they have got policies in place. I guess the question is whether Elon Musk, since he's come into Twitter, agrees with the plan and the policies that were set to deal with the midterms, which are next week. 
All right, we just got some breaking news that Twitter CMO Leslie Berland, also the head of People, is leaving Twitter. Um, this, of course, along with a number of top executives, including Parag Agrawal, the CEO, Ned Siegel, the CFO, Vijay Gade, um, Sean Edgett uh, on the legal team. Again, Twitter CMO Leslie Berland also leaving the company, and she certainly won't be the last one if our reporting is correct. Bloomberg's Alex Barinka and Ed Ludlow. Thank you both. Turning now to the world of gaming. Activision Blizzard said its Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 raked in $800 million in the first three days of launch, the best in franchise history. Here for an exclusive interview is Johanna Ferris, Senior Vice President at Activision Blizzard. Johanna, thank you so much for joining us. So obviously a huge weekend. What do you think is driving this, given the broader macro concerns and the pressures on consumers? Why are we seeing this show up with Call of Duty? It's amazing. This is a testament to the community worldwide that we have. There's so much passion built into this franchise, and in particular for Modern Warfare 2. But to be hitting these numbers out the gates the way that we've launched here has been tremendous. It just reflects how powerful a community of players we, we have, but also the magic that's been poured in by all the development teams around the world here at Activision Blizzard. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just in a very celebratory moment here to do these types of numbers, as you mentioned, and it proves that we have a blockbuster on our hands across all of entertainment and we couldn't be prouder. And it's topping some of the big movie theater blockbusters, Top Gun, Maverick and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness combined. What does that tell you about the popularity of games versus other kinds of entertainment as audiences evolve? I often say it feels like it's the modern medium for entertainment. It's how people are gathering. They're creating friendships. They're creating lifelong connections through Call of Duty. And again, this is just that moment where we couldn't be more proud to see so many different regions of the globe connect in this way. You're right. I think some of the numbers are really staggering. It, it proves the power of gaming. We certainly have fierce competition ourselves, right? So we know that we are all fighting for consumers' time um, and for how they make their choices and to see so many of our players uh, rally uh, together here and, and pour in their feedback, pour in their connections. Just three days out of launch has been amazing and, and we're incredibly excited for what's to come. Bloomberg has reported that Activision is adding, replacing next year's Call of Duty entry with added content for this year's game. Tell us where the franchise is going next. Fans want to know. Actually, all of our eyes are in a couple of weeks from now. We have a new Warzone experience coming. And for those who don't know, this is another new way to play Call of Duty. Uh, Warzone took the world by storm three years ago. This is the 2.0 version of that experience. It's free to play. So everyone can drop in and have an extremely awesome experience playing Battle Royale, which is another way to play Call of Duty. We're really excited about that coming on November 16th. There's so much going on in the modern warfare universe. So we're excited because again, this has been a tremendous launch for us, but there's so much more in store and even just weeks away here with Warzone 2.0. So more to come. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll let you get away with that one, despite fans wanting to know. Um, it's no secret that Activision has been working through some cultural issues, and I'd love to hear your perspective on how that is evolving and what it's like being a senior woman in gaming at Activision. Look, we've had our challenges, and a lot of companies have their own challenges as well when you think about how big um, our workforce is, and it's not um, something that we take lightly. This is a priority for us to make sure that we continue to improve in workplace culture. I, for one, you know, have always felt um, so welcomed here. I've been here for about four years now and I've just been so blown away by the caliber of the talent, the collaboration that we continue to see pouring in. And we've made this a top priority. We have no you know, um, tolerance at all for bad behavior. We've already said that in many statements before. And we're gonna continue to make these investments to make sure that this is the place that people want to continue to work. And it all comes down to talent. I, I always come back to that as we need the best and brightest here. We're lucky to have so many of them under the Activ Activision Blizzard umbrella already. This is why Modern Warfare 2 has done what it's done because we have amazing talent all over the world pouring in. And yet we want to continue to get better and continue to attract the best talent we can. 
Meantime, you're navigating a potential huge acquisition by Microsoft. UK regulators are scrutinizing the deal. What can you tell us about any signal that you've gotten from regulators about whether or not and when this deal is going to happen? All of my eyes have really been on Call of Duty, I promise you that. I mean, I know the, the statements are out there, as you know. Uh, Microsoft has already commented on this quite a bit. Look, the possibilities are very exciting. Um, I think we're, we all understand the scope of that. And yet we are here focused to do what we came here to do, which is to deliver the best possible player experiences we can. Uh, and the Call of Duty milestones we've hit here have been just tremendous and a testament again to how much work has poured in. So more to come, um, but uh, all eyes on, on this moment. And, and again, I just really feel very honored and humbled to be a part of it. More to come indeed. Well, thank you for sharing those new numbers on Call of Duty with us. We will stay tuned. Activision Blizzard Senior Vice President Johanna Ferris. Thank you. All right. Coming up, Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital mulling a big restructuring. We're going to discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Firm Galaxy Digital currently has 375 employees, but that number could soon change. Bloomberg Shanali Basik here to explain. Shanali, what's happening? Pretty enormous scoop today here, Emily, by our colleagues led by Yuechi Yang, because Galaxy may be laying off 15 to 20 percent of their workforce. That could amount to as much as 75 people. Uh, I want to point out here that pretty recently Galaxy had actually been hiring. And so this is definitely a new plan that we are seeing. The stock is off more than 70 percent this year. Remember, earlier this year, they also had that plan to buy a bit go, but that had fallen through as well. That would have added more staff. So really a reversal in trajectory here. And 75 positions could go at Galaxy. Now, Galaxy reports results next week. So hearing what Mike Novogratz has to say will be interesting. Remember, Galaxy is one of the earliest investment banks in this space. They have become a very large operation with principal investing, with venture capital investing, a huge research arm. So where exactly they're going to be able to trim some of that will be of interest. I think also of interest here Emily, is what they will say in terms of their liquidity positions. You have them having $1.5 billion as of June 30th. $1 billion of that was in cash. But if you take a look here, we have a board on the screen of all the job cuts that are spreading across the entire crypto industry. Coinbase, Robinhood, BlockFi, Genesis, and now Galaxy. The question is, we've talked about their revolving door on the C-suite and then now maybe on the younger side as well or in the junior ranks as well. Does uh, those jobs, where do those jobs go next? Is there capacity in the crypto industry to pick up the those jobs as we're seeing some large firms start to scale back, given that range bound uh, trading you've seen in the largest cryptocurrencies. All right, Shanali, thanks for helping us dig in there. We'll see how it evolved. Shanali Basik, appreciate it. Coming up, Grubhub's founder Mike Evans talks about his new book, Hangry, an emotion I'm sure we all can relate to. He's next. This is Bloomberg. Food delivery giant Grubhub is out with a new book, well, about his food business. Hangry, a startup legacy, details the step-by-step -step grind of building an innovative business with each chapter, including lessons for entrepreneurs and startups. Mike Evans joins me now to discuss more. So uh, after everything you've been through, Mike, what inspired you to put it all in a book? Yeah, I mean, the book is just the story of starting it in my apartment and running it all the way through the IPO. And it's an intense experience to take something from, create something from nothing and then go all the way through all the venture capital investments and all the things that come to it. And uh, I wanted to share that experience. And if I can sort of change a few people's minds about the importance of really thinking about what it is they're trying to accomplish as they build the thing that they're building, uh, that's really my goal with the book. And that's why I wrote it all down. What are, I mean, obviously, we, we've heard Elon Musk say things like starting a company is staring into the abyss of death and swallowing shards of 
shattered glass. What are some okay. lessons and takeaways from the early days? It's not that bad. Okay, okay. <laughs> I want your I want your metaphors. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I guess it's no piece of cake since it's food delivery. I gotta I gotta I gotta relate it to food. Yeah, it was challenging for sure, and uh, and that's one of the things that I've had to remember again as I started a new business that. You know, every step of the way, it's it, the path from sort of start to success is not just a straight path. It's a little bit more like a drunken ramble. You try things, you experiment. It's important to be able to quit the things that aren't working and to really double down on the things that are. But it takes an, ir- an iterative and experimental approach to really take a business and, and, and make it something that customers love. Hangry is something I've certainly felt and uh, food delivery companies have helped uh, appease. Why did you call it that? Yeah. So I started the business because I wanted a pizza and I was hungry and, uh, it started (laughs) out as a hobby and I didn't love working for another person and sort of being just a software developer, as I was called a few times. And in that early part of my sort of work experience. And so that, that is really where the idea came from. I was trying to solve a problem for myself. And I make the point in the book that, you know, entrepreneurs tend to not be happy people because you look around and you see that something is wrong and you're more annoyed by it than maybe some of your friends and family are. And the difference between that, uh, that person being just a miserable grump and an entrepreneur is sort of getting off the couch and doing something about it. And so a lot of that motivation came from just really kind of being sick of having to call on the phone and having orders like get messed up and reading a credit card over the phone, all those things. I can't cook. I can't stand cooking. And so I had to solve the problem. Uh, and so that's why I started the food, uh, the food delivery, you know, online ordering business. Um, and ultimately I did solve the problem. And so um, it's that it's, it really just sort of goes through the experience of just what it's like emotionally to, to sort of do these 80, 90 hour weeks and over the course of a decade. Startups are hard. Food delivery startups are hard. As you said, we just had Uber CEO Dara Khosra Shahi on earlier in the show Uber Eats still doing well, good profit, but not a a huge uh, amount of growth. So I'm curious, when you look at the food delivery wars today between Grubhub and Uber Eats and DoorDash, do they all survive? Uh, Do they coexist uh, at this current size? Or is there consolidation? How does the industry change? I don't think they can coexist in the way, the way things are currently going. Ultimately, the winner in the space is going to be the one that creates the best product for customers. And the one that creates the best product for customers is going to be the one that creates the best product for restaurants and for the drivers. And ultimately, that's really, I think, where innovation and differentiation is going to come from. And the company that does that the best will ultimately win the loyalty and frequency of the diners that use the platforms. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it shakes out because, um, you know, I think there's room for differentiation among those three right now. So you're not unbiased, but who wins? Who doesn't survive? Grub has this partnership with Amazon. Is that a real differentiator or not? I think Grub, I, I am not biased. I think Grubhub has an edge because it has more relationships with independent restaurants. And I think ultimately the neighborhood gems and the independent restaurants and the, you know, the, the those businesses that sort of make up the heart of a lot of downtowns, whether it's in big cities or small cities, those are the things that customers love the most. And I think that Grubhub has an advantage there. And so my that's my hope, obviously. I'm not, I'm not biased. Um, but ultimately, really, it, ultimately, really, it just comes down to which company is going to invest in those things the most. So last quick question, you talk about stepping down. Why was why was when you stepped down the right time? And as you say, stepping down isn't quitting. Yeah, I talk about this in the book. The, you know, my goal when I started Grubhub was to pay off my school debt. And I overshot by a little bit, right? I ran the company from the from the apart, my, my apartment all the way up to the IPO, I was myself and my co-founder, Matt, we ran the company together. And as I got towards the end of that journey, as I approached the IPO, for me, the reason that I decided to go on to do the next thing is I really wanted to work on a business where the impact of what I was doing from a social perspective and the profit I was creating were the same thing in whatever business model that was. That's okay. really challenging to do in a public company. I'm not even sure it's actually possible a lot of the time. And so um, I wanted to start a okay. new company where we can make that the DNA of the company from scratch. 
And so that's why I went off Mike, to start my new we'll thing. We'll have to leave it there, uh, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you. Congrats on the book. We'll see you tomorrow. This is Blue.